So we'll start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. Thank you for the chance to share and to listen to your word and to pray. And we pray that we can do that in a very special way tonight, especially deepening on passion, what it means to be in Holy Week and to let God speak to us in a special way. And we can ask Mother Mary's help to do that. Hail Mary, for the grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was talking a little bit already started, but uh, just for those, some will watch this for the first time as well too. So I was saying that we're, we're hermeneutical beings. This long word means that we are beings that interpret, people who interpret the world around us, we relate to it and we react to it. That's what we try and do with the Bible. In a very special way here, this isn't a Bible study in the sense that we try and learn what, what the Bible is about or what this is trying to tell, uh, what was the truth behind this part, that's part of it. But if we only stay there, then we haven't really made it part of your life. So the, the plan of the, the school of the word is that we, we practice, like at school, how to interpret the Bible so that it means something for your life. How do we let it become uh, part of your life so that it's the living word of God, not just something written, a historical text 2,000 years ago. So the idea is to do that tonight with the, the, the passion of Jesus. And I thought we'll use the past, passage of, um, of Judas and Peter. And they can, because I find them very relatable. And we can do that in a special way where we can let them speak to us. And then hopefully at the end of it, we don't just only uh, get stuck with um, what happened to them was something that happened to other people. It's also a message for us and how we can live out our life in a different way. So I thought we could start especially with uh, John 13. So if you find John chapter 13, the Gospel of John chapter 13. And we'll start with verses 21 to 38. It was actually the gospel of today for those who went to Mass. And it talks obviously about Jesus being at the table, a good, uh, the Last Supper, with, with all of his friends, with his disciples. Afterwards, we'll skip ahead to John 18, but we'll, we'll go read through this quick. Um, who would like to read? Do we have any? Any volunteers? Yeah, very good. Greg, first, first time here. Maybe if you come up here closer, you can read it out. So read verses 21 to 38. Oh, yeah, you can see it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Hi, everybody. After saying this, Jesus was... Wait, up to where, sorry? Where's yep, the, up where's to the 38. End? Up to 38. So it's the end of that. Okay. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So when reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. But when he had dipped this, the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, but, why, but what we need for the festival, or, or buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So immediately, where is it? So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him 
in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. We get you in to, to, to speak, yeah? To, first time. Now, it's, it's really good listening to this, this part because you can see that um, Jesus, in this moment, tried to warn his friends about what was going to happen. So he's trying to speak to both of them. So very clearly to Judas, he said, look, this is what's going to happen. And then also to Peter. I really found it quite interesting about the two responses that both of them gave. And especially, I think we'll be able to, to connect with that as, as it, how it affects ourselves and our own relationship with God and everything as well too. But first and foremost, Judas. Judas seemed to basically ignore Jesus altogether. He doesn't respond. It's quite interesting. Like Jesus very openly says, what of you is going to do this with your life? And all, it says that the other one sort of said, who's going to do it? Or do you want to try and find out? But Judas just tries to be very, very quiet and doesn't say anything at all. And, and think. so it's quite interesting, this part. I was praying about, like, what do you think would be going through his head? We can't obviously know exactly, but you can start to try and interpret it about what it might mean. So, for example, I was thinking that he was really trying to hide what he was thinking. Maybe he was trying to hide that double life that he'd been living and that was going on inside him, but he was trying not to, not to let the others see what Jesus was talking about. So imagine when they were all looking around, what, what's, what's Jesus talking about? Is it me? Is it me? Like, it, it seems like here, it doesn't, like he, he doesn't want to say it. So he just stays silent. It stays very, very quiet. So it's, I, I found this quite interesting. What happens when we don't respond when God tries to call us to, to a conversion or a transformation in our heart? And for, my, for me, I was thinking maybe Judas had got so used to living a lie, so used to living a double life, that he thought that he could get away with it now. That it had become basically second nature in his own life, that he thought that basically maybe he'd been getting away with it so long, <laughs> like he'd been doing sneaky things for a little bit, maybe been using music. I said that in another part of the Gospel of John, that he was helping himself to the treasury a little bit. They're the taking a bit of money here and there. So, so maybe he'd been doing this for so long that he thought that basically, as long as I just put on the face, no one else will be able to see any different, including Jesus. So it was like he thought that in this one, maybe he was even thinking, I can even fool God. <laughs> I, can, I can get away with it. I can get away with it. It's quite interesting. Can you relate to that? Can you relate to that with your own life? I know I can. And I try not, not to, obviously, but so many times I've got used to saying, for example, I try not to do that this much, but if you think of your own life, how many times have you smiled and said something very nice to someone, but inside you were sitting there going, I don't like this person at all. <laughs> I wish I could say something else. I'm actually criticizing them in my mind, but in the, in there in front of them, I'm smiling. Ah, very nice, this person, very good. Living a double life. And you think that you could probably get away with it as well too. Like this person will never know what I'm really feeling inside. And sometimes even like we can do it even with God. I don't know if you've had that experience of being here in the chapel or wherever you want to pray in that moment, looking very holy from the outside, looks like you are praying that really where's your mind? Not here, many times in another place completely or doing something else completely. Even these days with the, I actually write a lot of my stuff on my, on my tablet. How easy it is on the tablet to switch across to, to read something else or to do something else. Everyone else thinking, oh, wow, he's very holy here in the church. 
then how holy is he really? What's happening inside? I was thinking about that. Obviously, it gets much, much worse when it's something very serious, obviously. So with Judas, we're talking about something very serious. He was betraying his God, betraying his best friend, was going to hand him over. I don't know whether he really thought that he was going to die. He was handing him over for money and it was ready to do that. So many times, I think when it comes to something more serious about sin, more serious about our addictions or our, our temptations, being lazy, cheating, cheating other people with our businesses and stuff like that, it can get very, very common that we get so used to living in a certain way, we basically justify it. And we start to get to this point where as long as I don't, don't bring it to light, we just let it go. And it, it, it can be the trap that we can fall into. And we can find ourselves, like Judas, getting to this point where, yeah, you don't really care anymore. And I was, I was so many times, I, I, I don't say about what other people say to us in confessions or anything like that, but I'm just talking about when people talk to you. If you talk to people these days, so much double life going on. And especially, I, 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 Greg here is one of our student leaders in our Spark group, in our youth groups. Like when you talk to the young ones, like what they're watching, what they're doing, like there's a lot of weird stuff happening and like they, they're getting away with it without realizing, well, thinking that it's not making an effect. So on the outside, trying to put up one facade, on the inside, something completely different. And when I'm not, I'm never one that's saying like I'm, I'm free of that either. I, I do my own things all the time as well, too, where I, I act one way and stuff. So I was thinking about that. How I wish Judas had responded differently. How I wish he had uh, he changed the way he'd lived or taken that, that opportunity to, to live. Uh, yeah, like to listen to this opportunity of Jesus to actually, um, how would you say? Uh, have, a ch have a chance to, to, to um, con convert change in that moment. Once... I don't know if you've ever done this. I'm going to share with you a poem that I wrote. I'm not a very good poet, but this I wrote one time. I'm going up there. I said what he should have prayed. So it was, it was my idea about what thinking about Judas in this moment. I wrote this a while ago. He should have prayed when he heard Jesus saying that, oh, please don't get, let me be the one. Oh, please give me the strength so it passes by. Oh, not to be the one who betrays the son not the one causing the innocent to die. Oh, please don't let me be overcome. Please don't allow me that to be my fate. I was trying to make this rhyme. It doesn't rhyme very well. Oh, spare me the fire and sulfur of Saddam. Oh, spare my heart being engulfed in hate. Oh, please don't let me be the knave. Oh, please allow me to break my chain. Oh, not the one to bite the hand that gave. Oh, not the one that causes so much pain. Oh, let me be to my merciful father run. Oh, let me be the root of loss. But please don't let me be the one, but please not the one to put him on the cross. I was praying, I was being serious about that at one time. How I wish he had done that. And I believe that would have been why Jesus was bringing it up. He was trying to give Judas the chance to turn, to come back and listen. How it would have been different if he had have done that. Who knows what would have happened. We believe that Jesus had to, had to go to the cross as well too. But it's quite interesting like. Your own invitation. What are you going to do when Jesus asks you to change? Are you going to listen? Or are you going to stay silent like Judas? And we, it's very clear that it doesn't end well for Judas. He keeps on living that double life. But eventually it comes out. Eventually everyone knows and sees exactly what he was living. And honestly, I've never seen an example of sin that doesn't act, eventually come out like that eventually too. In my own life and then in life of others. You think about, for example, something, I don't know, something very obvious like cheating or uh, something like that. Sooner or later, it comes to light. There's no way, you, like eventually, and it comes out. And when it comes out, it's a disaster as well too. But, but many times, I think there's been a lot of chances where people can change that earlier if they took that option of listening to Jesus saying in this moment, look, you didn't have to live like that. Okay, what about Peter? We go to Peter. Peter's got a, a little bit of a different response than Judas, but it's interesting as well too. It's different. Whereas Judas stayed quiet, didn't try to say anything and like tried to, tried to hopefully, I don't know, pretend like no one else knew what was going on. Peter, on the other hand, tries to respond to Jesus. 
And he, he, but he tries to think, he somehow thinks that Jesus might be mistaken. We know Jesus is the Son of God, never wrong. Like Judas should have known, I mean, Peter should have known that by now, seen Jesus over and over again. But still in that moment, no, Jesus, you're wrong. Uh, I'm going to be the one to stay beside you the whole time. Even if I have to go to, to jail, I'll never, I'll lay down my life. For you. And Jesus, <laughs> very quietly, before even the cock crows three times, you're going to, you're going to deny me. But it's quite interesting. I was praying, what do you think Peter's main problem was? It wasn't so much the double life. I think he was quite open, actually, Peter. He, he was very, probably even a little bit too, some, too much sometimes, like he just said whatever he thinks many times and stuff like that. But I was praying, I don't know, my, my interpretation was that he relied too much on himself. His, his idea was that I can do it. Don't worry, Lord, trust me, I can do it. And almost, I can do it by myself. So he's relying on his own strength. So even like I was saying, what, what, what should have Judas, Judas prayed? Please, Lord, don't let me do this, whatever. Give me grace to live this in a different way. Peter also needed to pray that same prayer as well, too. But his idea was, no, I'm strong enough. I'm strong enough against. And it says Peter tried, I mean, Jesus tried to warn him. In one of the other versions, it says, uh, Satan's been given permission to try and sift you, to try and tempt you in this part. And it, but he still thinks I'm still strong enough to overcome it by myself and it's, it's interesting okay all of us are fallen all of us are bound towards falling to sin it's part of our life we're not perfect we've got the the concupiscence that we call it in, in our life so can you relate to peter with your life how does that speak to you how many times have you swore i'm not going i'm never going to do that again how many times have you said, for sure, I'm going to change. Lord, that's never going to happen. And then what's been normally been the result <laughs> at the end of it. So I was thinking, now I don't drink so much, actually, as a missionary. But when I was a bit younger, don't get too shocked by this, but when I used to go out with my friends, small country town, most of our, our socializing was done at the pub. I don't know how many times I woke up with a bit of a headache saying, I'm never, ever going to drink again. And then the next Friday comes around and then <laughs> your mates call you from the pub and then straight back down there again. But it was sort of, it becomes very much, if you build yourself only on your own, your own strength, you're weak by yourself. Of course, with the grace of God, we're strong. But with, by ourselves, we're so, so weak in that way. And I was thinking about so many other things that have been happening recently. I was thinking only in my own life, but maybe some of these things could, could jolt some things in yourself as well too what about your lenten resolutions how have they been going lately all the, all these plans to pray to fast to give arms like 100 all the way through 40 days of, of of purity and perfection how many times have i been unfaithful to prayer my fasting started off good i could say that much when, when i came at the beginning but uh, especially, yeah, many things. And then also, how many times have I said, okay, I'm going to pray in the morning. And then you get halfway through the day and you forgot. And even that I'm going to pray the rosary. And then you get to the end of the day and you, you end up saying it in bed. Because you haven't, <laughs> well, if you say it at all. Yeah? Like, like how many times have we had these, these, these desires to have the strength to do stuff, with proper intentions, good intentions in that moment. But in the end, uh, I was talking to someone the other day. Honestly, I don't swear very much anymore now, luckily. But that used to be one of my big things where every time I'm go never going to swear again and then someone cuts you off in traffic and then suddenly you find yourself inventing all these other types of words, everything I used to say it. And it, it just naturally came out many, many times. Like how many times yeah, have you had that experience of being Peter? Thinking you're strong enough, thinking you can do it all yourself. So what can we learn from him? Especially that we need help. Especially when God, when Jesus is the one saying, this could happen. Well, this is going to happen if you don't come back to me. Listen to it. I've been praying a lot about that recently. Like uh, The priest, you know how many things have happened to, with priests around the world, stuff like that, all the ways that they've got themselves into trouble and different things. Many, many times I've, thought to myself, that will never happen to me. 
and God willing, it will never happen to, you, to me in many things. And I'm talking about can be very, very serious things, but also even for the points where sometimes I've been critical of, <laughs> I'm letting go, or, this is not confession, but pretty, pretty close. But I've been very critical of people who, like priests who maybe don't seem to pray so much or don't seem to be so interested in pastoral things or, or wanting to evangelize or get stuck in different things. So you can be very critical, very, very thing. And, and many times I will never be that type of priest. I will always, and then when you get very busy and you get all the things, you realize you, all those things, there's a reason behind it. There's, there's something happening there. So I, I found myself very much sort of saying, uh, please God, not instead of like being that I will never do it and trying to say that this is going to, I'm going to be strong no matter what. Please, God, I beg you, don't let me fall into these things. Please, please give me the strength because I know how weak I am. I'm not strong enough to do that. Help me to, to live in a different way. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What Jesus said to Peter, very true. I can say 100%. So we can, I won't talk too much longer because we want to let people have a chance to pray. But we can go skip on to John 18. So we won't go through all the big prayer of Jesus where he's at the Last Supper. But when we go to John 18, you can see what, what happened to Judas and, and uh, Peter. And it's quite interesting to let that be part of your prayer as well, too. I won't, maybe we won't read it all out because it will take a little bit of time, but in your time to try and pray with it and, and do it. But we know for Peter, what happened with him? He tried to, tried to do with his own strength. It says that he even tried to fight. He said that he drew, drew his sword and tried to fight. He tried to cut off the, the ear of the servant. It didn't save you. It didn't stop what was going on. So his own strength wasn't strong enough in that part. And then where, do, where does he end up finding himself? When you see Judas, when he refused to listen to Jesus, it says that he, he fell into, it says back in that John 13, that, that Satan overtook him. So he went underneath the power of sin. He went outside and it was dark without the light of Jesus in his life. Here, it also shows that Peter, relying on his own strength, he ends up away from Jesus, following along behind him. And then Jesus goes into the high priest's house, gets taken in there, and Peter gets left outside. So again, outside, in the dark. And when he's in the dark, where does he go for, for light and for warmth? No longer to Jesus. He finds another fire and he warms himself around the other fire, but it's not strong enough. It's not enough for him to stay strong. And then you hear that's when he gets the, the people saying, aren't you one of them? And then he says, no, 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 of course not, not me. And then little by little gets further and further away from Jesus until eventually everything that he said that he wouldn't do, no way I'll ever do this. I'll die before all this ever happens. He does it within one night or even less. So not, not even one week later, it's within a couple of hours of, of saying, I will never, ever do this. And then he fell down and, and he did. It's quite interesting, uh, the process that, that it follows. Pray with it. Try and interpret it, relate it to your life. See what it means for you. Try and learn from it. It's the living word of God. There's meant to be something in there for you, speaking for you in that moment. And especially the same with Judas. I found Judas really that, really sad, actually, that that double life of Judas comes out very, very clearly. He kisses Jesus. That's how he betrays him, with a kiss. So a sign of friendship, sign of love, is how he betrays him and, and destroys him. And it comes out in front of everyone. And Jesus makes it very clear in that moment. Are you betraying me with a kiss? And then that was the turning point where he realized, <laughs> I think from that point, he must have realized that everyone knows what I'm doing here from now on. And he went into despair after that. I thought one last thing, just to pray a little bit about that. I found another poem of mine that I wrote a long time ago. I'll just show you this one. This will be my last one. But it was, I called it of Judas and Peter. And it's like the first part, Peter, uh, Judas, second part's Peter. When they found themselves in, in trouble. My heart pounds out aloud. So it was what I was hearing inside. I am damned. I am doomed. I remember too clearly just what you said. It seemed no time since you were in that room. All I know is that I wish I was dead. You are my life, my closest friend. Yet I am the reason that you are alone. 
friendless and abandoned till the bitter end, there is no way that I can atone. The way is clear, I know what to do. I now know the course laid out for me. I can't keep the silver that was given for you. I shall go and hang myself from a tree. That's where, that's where Judas went. He let, when he fell down, he didn't learn from it. He went into despair. He didn't understand that God could still take him out of that. He could give him another chance. Peter starts the same. My heart pounds out alert. I am damned. I am doomed. I remember too clearly just what you said. It seems no time since we're in that room. All I know is I wish I was dead. You are my friend, my, my close, you are my life, my closest friend. Yet I am the reason that you are alone, friendless and abandoned till the bitter end. There must be a way for me to atone. The way is unclear. I don't know what to do. But faithfully, I'll take what's laid out for me. I'll never deny you like the, when, before the cock crew, even if like you, they nail me to a tree. Quite interesting. Peter also ended up on a tree. Eventually, we believe in the tradition of the church. He got crucified as well too, but in a glorious way, connected with Jesus, living out that same passion. Judas, sadly, not so much. So to pray, pray with it. Try and make it something you can understand. Make it relevant for your life. You don't have to write poems. You write whatever you want. Find ways to make it connect to you can understand what you're reading, what you understand, what it means to your own life, but then connect it and try and find a way to live it. And that's what we do. This is the whole point of why we call it a school of the word. It's exercises. If it's a time of prayer where you work it, you try your hardest to listen to what God's saying and you let God speak to you and you try and understand how you can live it out in the best way possible as well too. So that this makes it meaning in your life and it changes the way that you're going to live. So I'll give out some questions. Uh, Yvonne, do you want to give these out to everyone? Hopefully they'll help you to pray. But I'll, I'll inv invite you to go to the text, go to the, the scripture itself more than anything else. And we'll put this into the chat for all the ones online. But the first part simply says, read carefully the interactions of Jesus with both Judas and Peter, found in, in the passages of John 13, 21 to 38, or John 18, 1 to 27. And then it says, what message can you learn from Judas in this passage? Now, there's a lot of questions here. You don't have to answer all these questions or whatever, but it's just hopefully going to prompt you into a time of prayer. What do you think happened to him? Does this relate to your own life? How? What will you try and do to apply this so that it makes a difference with how you're going to live? And allow it to change you or to think about it. Then have a look at Peter. What can you learn from him? Do you find his example relatable to your own life? Can you think of real life examples of something similar happening to you? What will you try and do so as to live your own life better going forward? And then the, the last part is like, pray with Jesus, like spend some time with him, thinking about what Judas and Peter did after they, they fell. Because all of us are going to end up in that situation at some stage, probably. That's, the, that's what Jesus says to them. Like, you're, you're all going to fall at some stage. When they, when they realized they betrayed that relationship, what did they do? Are you more tempted to rely on hope or are you more tempted to sink into despair? What can you do to show true repentance? How can you try and change it in your life? So I'll leave you with those questions. We can pray for 20 minutes. A bit more, we'll come back at 8.35 and we'll have a chance to share as well amongst us.